I sometimes say to people, how does Genesis start? In the beginning, God created the bits of the universe we don't yet understand. <laughs> well, that's what Hawking believes, you yeah, see, that yeah, kind of idea. Yeah. No, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That is everything. In other words, the bits we do understand and the bits we don't. But here's the interesting thing. It's the bits we do understand that point so strongly towards God. So the, it's important for us to understand, as much as we uh, revere what science can tell us, it's, it's important for us to understand the limits of science. Um, and I was talking to Dr. James Tour of Rice University in Houston. Do you know Dr. Tour? Very Tour? well. And he was telling me he's probably, no, not probably, he would say probably because he's being falsely humble. He is without doubt... Uh, the brightest and best nano scientist, nano chemist, nano biologist on planet Earth today. And he creates molecules in the lab. Mm -hmm. And he knows how difficult it is to create mo molecules. And he tells me that without any question, science has never even begun to answer the question of how life began and how molecules assemble themselves, because of course we can't be talking about evolution because there's no life, we're talking about dead molecules. And I thought if ever I needed an illustration of the limits of science, here you have the greatest nanoscientist in the world telling me, and of course he's a Christian, but telling me that in fact, not only don't we know it, we haven't even made any progress mm -hmm. on figuring out how molecules assemble themselves. He's very convincing, I, I find his arguments Absolutely convincing in that sense. And I've long maintained that the origin of life is the crucial thing. And as you rightly say, you cannot explain it by evolution because evolution, whatever it does or doesn't do, depends on the existence of life. And the existence of life is certainly bound up with the idea of a word base, a coded base, a genetic code and all its sheer complexity. It's not only the complexity of it, it's the nature of that complexity. This is a word, this is like a computer program. And it has always fascinated me that the language that has been deemed appropriate to describe molecular biology at this level is taken from computer science. And therefore the evidence that comes pouring forth is that no matter how far we go on naturalistic presuppositions, we're never going to get a solution. And it would be better to follow the evidence where it leads. It's very interesting to me that one of Dawkins' predecessors, the famous philosopher Anthony Flew, who was a great... Uh, uh, a great advocate of Hume's ideas that miracles violate the laws of nature. In high old life, he came to believe in God. And he said he believed in God because of the discovery of the nature of the genetic code, that it was a word, that this kind of semiotic language, there was no way it could be generated by chance. And he was perfectly prepared to make a very important point, and it's this. I want to follow the evidence where it leads. You see, if you assume that what science means is that you've got to have a naturalistic explanation, well, then I believe you're never going to get one. But if you say, look, I want to follow evidence where it leads, here's a word. What is our common experience of the genesis of words that have meaning it's mind, and therefore here is certainly an a priori reason to believe that there's a mind behind this whole business, as James Tour so very clearly asserts. And I would encourage listeners to watch his lecture at the University of Waterloo, the Pascal Lectures. He followed me, or I followed him, but his lectures are far better than mine, and they're well worth watching. Well, I, I have to say that it, it seems to me the more uh, I meet and get to know people like you and your books and, and James Tour and uh, some of the proponents of intelligent design like Stephen Meyer and Michael Behe, 
the more I am convinced that anyone with an open mind has to conclude at this point that there is no question that the evidence leads us in the direction uh, of believing in a a God who created the universe. In other words, even though we might not be able to, to prove it, if I had to make a choice, the evidence of late, perhaps 100 years ago this wasn't true, but, but because of what we now know through science, the evidence has become overwhelming, pointing in that direction. It has, and let me just pick you up, on the, although we cannot prove it. The word proof, unfortunately, is ambiguous uh, in the English language. And when we say we don't have proof, what that should mean is we cannot prove it like we can prove a syllogism in mathematics or a theorem in mathematics. But you cannot prove anything like that outside mathematics. Correct. You can't do that in physics or anywhere else or chemistry. What you get in these fields is proof in the legal sense that is beyond reasonable doubt. Now, when people react and say, oh, that's not strong enough, I say it is strong enough. I couldn't prove to you mathematically that the jumbo jet that brought me to New York a few days ago was going to get me here. But I trusted my life to it because I think there's enough evidence. And when we made an auto, fully automatic landing at JFK in fog, and the runway became visible about one and a half seconds before we touched oh. down. And the pilot said, switch off all your phones, make sure every electronic thing is off because they could mislead the guidance mechanism. That'll get your attention. There's an example of committing your life to these these technological masterpieces, but you can't prove mathematically. And then on the more human level, I've been married for 51 years to the same person. I can't prove mathematically that she loves me, but I'd risk my life on it. Do you see the point? In other words, when we say we can't prove it, we mean we can't prove it mathematically, but we can give evidence for it. Well, John, this is the great lie that has crept into the culture, and it's why we're sitting here, because um, when we talk of faith and science, we talk about the Christian faith and science, up until fairly recently, there was no divide between the two. In fact, one, as you said in a previous program, uh, led to the other. A, a, a biblical faith led to the assumptions that led us to science, to do science. And, but we live in a culture now where we have to make the case over and over and over again because people have drunk the Kool-Aid and are somehow convinced of what they've been told over and over and over, for example, that the only proof that we can have is scientific proof. You've just said, and I know it to be true, it, that's sheer nonsense, but it we is, have to make that is, case yes. over and over. Yeah. And, and I, I've, I've often said uh, th the same thing. You know, we say Napoleon existed and we talk about his life. Well, prove it in, in a lab, prove it scientifically. Yeah, yeah, Nobody yeah. would even want to prove it scientifically. No, but you can historically give but evidence of, for it. But of it. course, we can use logic and we can use evidence. And that's what we do in our lives with just about everything. Of course it is. And we have to redeem the ground in the culture, so to speak. We all know what evidence-based faith is. And the crucial thing to grasp is that the, the atheists are wrong when they say Christianity is not an evidence-based faith. It is. I think that we need to bring another thing in. I, I wondered, why is it that so many of these people, Hawking in particular when he was alive, told people, you've got to choose between science and God. I could never understand that until one day it dawned on me what the reason was. It's because of his concept of God. You see, when I was younger, if I used the word God, it meant the creator of the universe, eternal, independent of the universe, who creates and upholds it. But you see, now they're so hung up on the idea that God is a fiction that they've reduced the God of the Bible to the level of the Greek God of thunder. See? Right. Now, a course on atmospheric physics will remove the need for the God of thunder straight away. And so you get atheists. Hey there, folks. If you enjoy this video and want to see more interviews like this one, make sure to subscribe to my channel. Please just hit the subscribe button below. Click the notification bell so you don't miss new content every single week. 90% of you who watch are not subscribed. 
and you could be in the first 100,000 subscribers to my channel. I would love that. Please subscribe. God bless you. Stephen Hawking, the late Stephen Hawking, gave people the impression, and many people have it, you've got to choose between science and God. And if you want to be regarded as a thinker, you forget God. And I was puzzled until I realized that that comes from having a false concept of God. That's thinking of God as what we call a God of the gaps. The Greeks didn't understand thunder, so they postulated a God of thunder. That God will disappear once you've done a little bit of atmospheric physics. So the idea is that God is a kind of placeholder that you believe in until science fills that space. Now, uh, two bad, seriously, error here. The first is that the gods of the ancient world, as a brilliant Oxford don, Werner, Werner Jaeger said, the Greek gods are descended from the heaven and the earth. They were created by the primeval chaos. The God of the Bible created the heavens and the earth. So if you put them in the same category, you just don't understand. It's a failure of understanding what these Greek gods were. Now that's the first thing. But you see, that means that because the God of the Bible created the heavens and the earth, he's not threatened by science at all because he's the God of the bits we do understand as well as the gods we don't. I sometimes say to people, how does Genesis start? In the beginning, God created the bits of the universe we don't yet understand. <laughs> well, that's what Hawking believes, you yeah, see, that yeah. kind of idea. Yeah. No, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That is everything. In other words, the bits we do understand and the bits we don't. But here's the interesting thing. It's the bits we do understand that point so strongly towards God. We've just been talking about the DNA molecule, this word. Newton, when he discovered the law of gravitation, didn't say, oh, I've got a law of gravity, I don't need God. No. He said, what a brilliant God that does it that way. And it's the same with us. If we go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art here or wherever in London or Amsterdam, and we see a painting, the more we know about painting, the more we admire the genius of the person that did it that way. The less we know about painting, the less we'll be able to admire their genius. And so the more I understand, as a mathematician, some kind of a scientist, of the way the universe works and the way it's describable, the more I admire the God that did it that way. Because science doesn't threaten him. Isn't it true? I mean, I have to say that uh, I, I wrote a piece in the Wall Street Journal a number of years ago, which uh, was a, a, a shortened form of some chapters in my book, Miracles, which themselves uh, took much of their uh, information from your book. So I want to tell people <laughs> to read your books. But in that piece, I said... That's they Gunning for God, they, I think. They titled, yes, that's right. They titled it, uh, Science Increasingly Makes the Case for God. Um, and I, I do make that point that I think scientists today, many of them are scared because they have had a lot of cultural power. And the evidence now very strongly points away from their atheist theses, and they're frightened. And so all they can do uh, is make a lot of noise and try to redefine terms and try to say that you're stupid if you even question yeah. these kinds of things, and try to use these false arguments. I mean, to say that I don't believe in Zeus, and I don't believe in uh, Era, yeah. and I don't believe in this one or that one, and, and I also don't believe in Jesus, as though there's some kind of, th that's called sophistry. Let, let's face it, it anybody is, yeah. who's serious wouldn't say that. And, but I really do think that there's a real fear uh, and that they have a narrative and that they become hostile because their power has been threatened, their cultural power has been threatened. I think that's very real, but it's good to remind ourselves that not all scientists are like that. First, stepping back from this historically, many people don't realize that in the 100 years between 1900 and 2000, over 60% of Nobel Prize winners believed in God. That's point number one. That's amazing. And when people say to me, look, science and God cannot live together, I say, well, what do you make of Francis Collins, who 
worked on the Human Genome Project, directed it, right. and is now the director of the National Institute of Health. Yeah. And what do you make of Bill Phillips, who won the Nobel Prize for Physics? They're both Christians. You see, if science and God were total aliens and enemies, you would never have a Nobel Prize winner for physics who's a believer. You just wouldn't get it. And that's enough to tell me that this n assumption that science and God are enemies, there's something seriously flawed with it. It's, it's actually absolutely false.